if you have your Bibles. It's a little bit of a lengthy text, so if you don't want to stand today, you don't have to. If you want to, uh, it's up to you. I'm not going to make you. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Man, look at you guys. Just tell you what. Love your spirit. Now, I'll profess today, this morning's message will be the big idea, and tonight's message will be how to execute or how to implement the big idea. I couldn't put it all in one. I had to break it in two, okay? Uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. I'm going to start in about verse 43. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be the be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest, that don't sound like good English, does it? Shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for a few, for some, for many. Jesus is saying, I came with the intention of setting a lot of people free. Comma, verse 46, and they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho, with his disciples and a great number of people. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side, everybody say begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, be of good comfort, arise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Here it comes. The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus had to go think about it. Jesus had to go pray about it. Jesus had to get in touch with his feelings on the subject. Jesus had to consult Facebook. He had to put a survey out in front of his friends. Jesus said unto him, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And after two or three days, when tax season came, immediately he received his sight. See, Jesus said, you can go your way, but after Jesus healed him, he followed Jesus in the way. I want to preach a little bit today on a simple thought. May get you to Cracker Barrel before other denominations are able to get there today. It's not based on the length of my preaching. It's based on the length of your response. Today, I want to preach a simple thought is, Begging for change. Begging for change. Jesus, anoint our ears to hear. God, stir our heart. God, captivate our imagination of what is possible by you. God, let us not leave here the same way we came in. But God, even in a moment of time, let your word find good ground. And God, let it be fruitful and cause a decision in somebody's heart to say, I'm not going to leave here the same way I came in. I'm going to be changed. I'm going to have my spiritual vision restored. I'm going to see things I've never seen before because I'm expecting you to meet my need. And everybody say in Jesus' name. Why don't you give God a hand clap of praise today before you're seated? This month we've been talking in a series on being uncomfortable, getting out of your comfort zone. 
If I were to summarize the big thought, the big idea today is how to get out of our uncomfort zone. This passage in Mark tells us that Jesus had been given a teachable moment to his disciples. He said, we've come with a purpose. We're not coming to build a religious organization. And we're not here to establish big buildings where people can come pay and serve us. We have come. We are purpose. Our intent is that we can come and pay a ransom. The enemy has kidnapped some souls that God had intended to use. But Jesus was not uh, willing to allow them kidnap souls to stay in bondage. He said, we have come and I'm going to pay the ultimate price. I know for what cause I came. I came to lead captivity captive and give gifts to men. I'm going to pay a ransom that no man can pay. Not that we can be slaves unto God, but that we could be sons and daughters. He wants to engraft us into the family. Jewel and I were privileged to go to college a year or so together, and we had to take chemistry, and uh, we we would go to chemistry class, but then it wasn't enough to go just to the class and learn the concepts. Then we had to go into the laboratory and demonstrate that we could execute the experiment and uh, record our conclusions to verify that we had mastered that chemistry concept. Jesus is given lecture to his disciples for what their purpose was, but when they came through Jericho, he said, let me demonstrate to you what I'm talking about. The Bible says he went into Jericho. Do you know under the law, it was forbidden for an Orthodox Jew to go into Jericho. It had been cursed. It had been cast down, and it was not supposed to be rebuilt. Can I tell you, Jesus is not afraid of your circumstance and he is not limited by your geography you may be going through the pit of hell but my God when he died on the cross he descended into hell he's not afraid of your circumstance he will be not not be stopped by your bad decisions or your checkered past our God has an agenda it's not to leave you like you are it's to bring you out and set you free But I'm going to ask a question. Have you ever been made to feel uncomfortable when somebody comes up to you begging? Anybody gotten off I-24 at Bell Road and get caught by the light? Roll the wind up, lock the door, don't make eye contact. I have my eyes fixed on Jerusalem. I'm not looking for the right of the I've struggled with that. It can make us uncomfortable. But I got to tell you something. It, it is very humbling to see somebody at a place that all pretense and pride, all grandeur or self-image has evaporated. Their need for some tangible result is greater than their personal pride. I had a situation some days ago, kind of the inspiration for our thought today. I came out of a business, and a guy came from my blind side. And he said, hey, man, I I was startled just a bit. I'm not going to lie. I froze for just a second. And he did not look threatening to me, but he looked like a guy who had had a hard way to go. And I said, yeah, can I help you? He says, man, I'm just begging for change. Now, let me stop and be pastoral for a minute. Too often we don't give because we perceive the decisions that person's made has led them to this shape. And so unless I think I can invest in them and they turn their life around, I'm not going to give to them. But can I also tell you this today? That we don't need to give to people only because we think they're going to turn their life around. God might be using us not to turn their life around, but just to put food in their belly today. You, you don't believe what I'm talking about? 
Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaking, he says, refuse not a beggar. There's no condition. It says, refuse not a beggar. It made me so uncomfortable for him to ask me on the spot because I didn't want to dig my wallet out in front of somebody I didn't know. Is that too real, too transparent? But I felt compelled, Brother Alford, when he says, I'm begging for change. There's a double meaning there. He meant coins. But I've come to tell somebody today, God responds when people say, I'm not afraid to beg. I need something to change in my life. When he said, I'm begging for change, it touched me. He wasn't trying to put a touch on me to make his house payment, to to make his Land Rover payment. Some of y'all get that later. He said, just a little change would make a big difference in my circumstance. I'm afraid many of us get comfortable in our current status. We get comfortable in our discomfort. And we're unwilling to step out and ask. We become okay with what's not right in our lives. But this guy, I believe prophetically speaking to me, is saying, I'm begging for change. He's asking for so little. Do you know what it did to me? It caused me to give him more than I would have. Why? I love his spirit. He's not looking for me to pay all his bills. He's saying, I just need a cup of coffee. I just need a little. T- Can I tell you what? We need to be able to admit what we have need of. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, here's what I want you to get. We're turned off in Western civilization to the term begging or to beg. That we are a land of so much and plenty and we're so prideful as Western culture Americans that we don't see it as part of the culture. But you travel this globe, begging in a lot of countries is normal. I went through scripture and I had to quit counting the encounters of beggars. It was their social insecurity program of the day. If you wanted to eat, you had to swallow your pride and be honest about your need. And you had to throw yourself on the compassion of others. I can't speak for you, but sometimes knowing the opposite of a word helps me understand the meaning of a word. The opposite, if you look up at the antonyms for beg, is to command, demand. Or even refuse or reject. To beg, you must be humble enough to ask and not willing to let opportunities pass you by. Stay with me. When you humble yourself, you're acknowledging you don't have the answers. You're saying, I can't fix it. And I'm tired of doing it myself. My pride is all spent. I am willing... To make a public declaration of my situation so I can receive some change. Second part is, I'm not going to let you get by me and miss my opportunity. Now, Pastor, what does this have to do with us today? When that beggar spoke, I am begging for change, it rang in my ears. I had a revelation. It was His humility with the clear communication of his situation that compelled me to respond. Jesus also says in Matthew 7, 11, If an earthly father knows how to give good gifts to his children, how much more does our heavenly father know? But it's not activated just because he knows because he's omniscient. He knows everything. What activates God's action? Those who know a heavenly father and those who, everybody say, ask. 
You have not because you ask not. Bartimaeus began to cry out. I believe he had heard it shouted around him about Jesus of Nazareth coming through and his exploits had become common knowledge. And when Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he made those around him uncomfortable. He began to scream and shout. Bartimaeus said, Son of David, have mercy on me. Poor Sister Stacy. We have new lights. I can't see y'all in here. Oh, there you are. From the Greek, that word cried, it don't mean, oh, boo nobody loves me. Nobody liked my post on Facebook. Nobody wanted to be my secret sister. Nobody loves me. That word cried is the same root word where we get the word croaked. Who's ever heard a frog croak? He doesn't go, Rrr. he goes, wark, wark. It also means to scream. Bartimaeus wouldn't say, I'm over here, Lord. If you have any extra change, I could use it. Bartimaeus says, I don't care who else you help today. Come by here. I'm talking about somebody who wasn't caring about what everybody else wasn't doing. He says, I'm begging for some change. I am blind. I can't pay my bills. I get abused. People take advantage of me, and I'm not willing to stay this way. I'm talking about somebody who's willing to get out of their comfort zone and step out into their uncomfort zone and say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm tired of getting my friends around me and complaining instead of allowing he who is able to do something about it to do something about it. They were uncomfortable with his begging. He was uncomfortable with their quietness. The more they charged him, I don't like charging because that leads to credit. Some of y'all who know me know I, I don't like charging. The word charge literally means from the Greek, they were saying for him to show the proper respect to him. Can I tell you something? Revelation right here. He was showing the proper respect. The rest of them were just hanging on to be entertained. But he said, thou son of David. He's showing him the proper respect. He's declaring him as the Messiah, the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sins of the world. And by his stripes we are healed. He was the only one showing the proper respect. My God is able. Your reaching out to God is directly proportional to your perception of what he's able to do. If you worship him like this, he's a little God. But if you can't sit still and you can't quit declaring his goodness and mercy, and he is the answer to every problem. How many times do we let others affect us getting from God what we need? Because we might make people uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable. Some of y'all get uncomfortable with yourself. I watch people. I'm a, I'm a people watcher. I can't help it. God may deliver me from that one day. I go shopping with Julie. She shops and I watch people. I'm good at reading people. And I see sometimes it starts getting in here. And then it starts getting in here. And then it starts kind of getting in here. And you, whoa. I, I, I. I I, I, I want to worship, but ooh, I, don't, I get a little uncomfortable here. I, I don't know if I can handle people can handle. Do you know when God moves? The word does not record a single miracle he does going through Jericho. And he's got a crowd following him out of Jericho. And nothing's recorded that he did. The only person that got anything out of Jesus in that journey was he who was not worried about what everybody else was thinking. Be quiet. Show him respect. Be dignified. He said, I'm showing respect. Oh, son of David, the only one that can solve my problem, the only one that can heal my body, the only one that can put my family back 
together. The only one that can turn my finances around. The only one that can take the pressure from me. The only one that can restore my joy. The only one that can wash my eyes. The only one that can forgive my sins. I'm not letting you get past me. I've got my cup out. I'm not worthy, but I know you're willing. I'm just believing that you're going to fill my cup, Lord. You're going to fill it to overflowing. I'm going to open myself up. What do you think repentance is but being willing to publicly acknowledge, I need God. I need God. Here's what I want to say. This is show respect. The Bible says he cried even more. A bunch of bullfrogs in a pond, croaking. Jesus says, I'm offended by his actions. Jesus says, he turned me off. Jesus said, that guy's crazy. Do you understand by his geography, we know that he was not an Orthodox Jew? He was not even in the the sheep of the lost, lost sheep of Israel. He's not even in that crowd. And, and Jesus was going to pass him by. Show me. Jesus like, if I wait a little longer, maybe he'll come. No, Jesus is on his way. Jesus responded to his cries. And then it got quiet. And Bartimaeus going, what's happening? What's ha-? He can't see what's happening. What's happening? What's happening? He's calling for you. He's calling for you. It doesn't say that anybody helped him get to Jesus. Y'all ever play Marco Polo? Somebody say it for me. Brian, say it for me. I ain't going to find you like that. Polo. Polo. I got a feeling Jesus kept saying, Bartimaeus, 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 Bartimaeus. He walked by faith, not by sight. How do I know that? Jesus asked him a question. What would you have me do? We cry out to God sometimes and he asks us, what do you want? We don't even know. He made it simple. He said, that I might see. Do you realize what Jesus' response was? He says to him, Bartimaeus, thy faith. When you were willing to step out of your comfort zone and everybody else was watching, you were crying out to me. Bartimaeus, when nobody was helping you, you groped your way to me. And you walked by faith. And because you responded in faith, he says, thy faith has made thee whole. I believe Jesus is in this place today asking somebody, what do you want? Are you comfortable with your discomfort? Are you desirous today to to beg for some change in your life? Do you want to see God turn some family around? Do you want to see God deliver you from some things? Are you interested in God healing your mind, body, soul, and spirit? Today, Jesus is here, and he's just looking for somebody to cry out to him. And when you feel that drawing of the spirit, you step out in faith. I don't see nothing but a bunch of steps across the front of the platform, but you don't look at it with physical eyes. You look at it with spiritual eyes, and as Jesus begins to call you out, uh, you begin to respond, and you draw nigh to Him, and guess what's going to happen? Your faith. uh, Not your perfection. Uh, I know you're from Jericho and you have no claims to the blessings of God. I know that you might have done something to mess your life up. And that beggar who came to me probably made a lot of bad decisions. It wasn't just one thing. It was probably a lot of things. But it didn't stop me from reaching down and putting something investment in him and our God is better than this pastor our God doesn't judge where you're coming from he's just waiting for you to ask ask brother Brian was preaching today he would zero in on and he cast off his garment did you know they had official begging clothes hey y'all ever driven down the interstate and see a flatbed trailer with a portable commode toilet on it and these guys in these orange vests out there picking up trash you get close enough you'll see a sign (laughs) volunteers of Rutherford County Jail they ain't volunteers 
I mean, they're not getting paid, but they're not volunteers. They're, they're not out there out of the kindness of their heart. They're out there. Okay. They wear clothing to identify them. Do you understand beggars in this day had clothes that you wouldn't be mistaken that somebody's just sitting down uh, resting their feet for a minute. They're wearing the type of garments that identify I'm in need. I, before Jesus healed him, the Bible says he threw off his begging clothes. I'm crazy enough to believe, Brother Daniel, that he had a revelation. If I can just get to Jesus, I, I'm not going to need these begging clothes no more. Some of y'all have been wearing garments of shame, garments of doubt, garments of depression, garments of despair, garments of I can't change. I'm telling you, you need to cast off some things that you've been identified long enough by, and you need to run to Jesus and see the faith meant by God's healing virtue who is able. He is able. I'm almost done. Only another hour, we're out of here. I'm going to give you a disclaimer. I'm giving no glory, no praise to the devil. But let me say this. The enemy tries to shut you down before you even get started stepping out. He starts speaking you're unworthy. You're where you're at because of what you've done. You've put yourself in here and you deserve it. Martin Luther, who led the Protestant Reformation, who was a professor in Europe in the 1490s. It's a long time ago. He was a great lecturer in his classroom, but he enjoyed eating lunch every day with his students. One day while breaking bread with his students, he had a little puppy dog that he owned, one of his only possessions, had no other family, puppy dog. And he would bring it into the dining room and put it at his feet while they ate. One of his students asked him to uh, illustrate what it's going to take to see the things spiritually in their lives they wanted to see. Martin Luther picked up the little puppy and said, this is what we need to be. A dog? He says, no. He said, when I'm picking up bread, taking it from my plate to my mouth, he watches me intently. Oh, if I could pray and watch like this puppy watches me. When he's watching that bread that's going to my mouth, he can't think of another thing. He has no other wish or no other desire. Oh, to God that we would be more like that little puppy. That we're not afraid to beg for the bread from the master's table. That we can fix our eyes on him. That little dog can't talk and he couldn't even say, I'm worthy and you owe it to me. He's just given the posture saying, if you'll just share it, I promise I'll eat ever a bit of it. You think I've lost my way? I'm telling somebody, there was a mother. The Bible says she was unwed. She had a daughter. Do you know her daughter was sick? In their culture, no woman would speak to a man out in public who was not her husband, especially a woman that had a cloud on her reputation who had children and no husband. But she didn't care about what other people thought about her reputation. She came to Jesus and said, I know you can heal my daughter who is sick. And Jesus rebuked her and said, this is improper. She came back and said, but oh Jesus, I know that thou art able for thou art sent from God. And he rebuked her. He says, don't you know that the meat I have is for the king's children? Thou art a dog. I'm telling somebody, she flipped the script on Jesus. He said, you're a dog. Now, if you go back and read that in the Greek, it's kind of offensive. It's kind of like a slur. She wasn't offended at what he said. 
because she wasn't focused on his put down. She was focused on he had the power. He had the ability. She had a daughter who had a need that she couldn't solve. She couldn't fix. And she says, oh, Jesus, even the dog gets the scraps from the master's table. What I'm telling you is, she got like that little puppy dog. You can call me a dog, but I'm watching the hand of God, and I'm seeing the blessings move from here to here. And all I can think about is not how unworthy I am, but how capable he is. I'm lost. I'm a dog. I'm unworthy. But my God is able to save to the uttermost. My God can deliver from the pit of hell. My God is able to bring you out of the pit. My God is able. What the enemy has taken, he can restore it sevenfold. My God can take you out of darkness. My God can set you upon the rock and a sure foundation. What you talking about today, Pastor? Anybody here ever felt unworthy? Anybody done stupid? You're in good company today. You know how I know that? If we're honest, we're all beggars. We all need God. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. And he has gone to prepare a place. And I'll even say it, he's even gone to prepare a table. But I love sharing what this woman says. Even, even a dog deserves the scraps. Do you know what she's really saying? She's saying, healing my daughter compared to your power and ability is just a little crumb. My Lord, if healing was a crumb, what would a loaf of bread be? Now, I, I'm preparing myself for the, the pushback on what I'm fixing to say. I've got my feet set. I've got a car parked out front to get me away in a hurry. In case there's... I, I know begging goes against our culture, and I think it goes against a lot of our pride. There is no biblical prohibition against begging. Well, David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. That is true. But it's not that we don't need the breakthrough from begging. It means that, that verse is saying God's always got it ready. He's just waiting on you <clears throat> to ask for it. Here, here, here it comes. You ready? I believe Jesus is a beggar too. He's passing through right now. Able to meet your needs. I literally believe that Jesus is speaking to some heart even now. And he's saying, I'm right here. I'm right here. Call me. Ask me. He's begging you to ask him to help. He's begging you. Oh, you don't believe it? Luke 19 tells us Jesus went to the mountain and looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. He cried. Do you know why he cried? The Bible says he cried specifically because people were blind to his visitation. And they're going to miss an opportunity to be touched by heaven. I believe there are people who've come to service after service after service here. And left the same way they came in. Because they couldn't get out of their comfort zone. With their discomfort. They were unwilling to get down to business. I'm telling you what. I've made up my mind if I have to hold the horns of the altar all the way to glory. If I have to repent every morning and afternoon, I'm going to make heaven my home. I'm not going to let the enemy tell me to be quiet. I'm going to say, Jesus, you have died for my sins. Jesus, you say I'm forgiven. God says I'm blessed. My family's blessed. I ain't feeling blessed, but I'm going to keep pursuing him. I'm not going to miss his visitation. I'm not going to miss an opportunity. If I'm in the house of the Lord today, I'm going to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I'm going to cry out to him. My Bible says those who cry out to him in their distresses, him will they hear. It's not enough to have it here. You got to not just have it here. 
But you've got to speak it. You've got to request it. You've got to verbalize it. His sister Beth comes to the piano. Do you know why Bartimaeus kept screaming? He's begging for change. Sister Josephine, you know why this mama who had no right or claim to Jesus' earthly ministry, why she kept pressing him? She is begging for change. The Bible says in the prophets that a good prophet stands and weeps between the altar and the door. Lest you think there's some big gulf fixed between the pulpit and the pew, I'm out here right now for a reason. There are some of you that are so weighted down and you've learned how to manage the overload. You've been coping with circumstances and self-medicating, developed escapism. Jesus is speaking to hearts in this place today. This is not the day to let Jesus get by. This is not the day to say, well, I'll get him another time. Do you know why? The Bible never records that Jesus ever went through Jericho again. And you don't know if this is your last chance for God to draw you. Well, it's the holidays and I'm going to have a great time and maybe later we have no promise of tomorrow. I'm not giving you a sad story. I'm telling you today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of healing and forgiveness and restoration. Please today, I want Sister Beth to sing this course, but I, I want you to stand. I, I want faith to be activated. If you're a saint in this place, begin to pray. If God leads you to just lay your hand, reach out to somebody, tell them today's your day. Oh, my.